So today I will be asking you questions all about touring, everything like the good things, the bad things, the fun experiences, the not so fun experiences, like everything pure about touring. So basically the first question is your first gig experience. What was the first gig you went to? When was it? Who was it? How old were you? Do you remember it? Wow. So there's, there's quite a, quite a few. I started off really young going to concerts. My father was a musician and, and was a session musician and friends with a lot of artists. So, um, as far back as I can remember, I've been on stage and going to concerts, but stuff that I like remember as far as like metal and, you know, stuff that's more relevant mm -hmm. to probably what, what we're talking about. Um, you know, I think it's it's probably my friends' local bands. You know, I think mm -hmm. I don't think I saw um, a famous band until whenever Clash of the Titans. That's probably my first big tour with uh, mm -hmm. Alice in Chains, Slayer, Anthrax. Uh, uh, was Megadeth on there? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so how old were you at that at that time? Ah. Uh, uh, probably 14, 15 years old. I got to think. Uh, 90, I got to do some backwards math. Probably 14. Okay, yeah. I'm trying to remember. I think mine was around 15 as well. I think my first big show was actually Linkin Park. That was the first oh, okay. and yeah, only yeah, yeah, experience yeah, yeah. Uh, we had because they never, ever 91. came to... 91. 91. My bad. It was 91. Okay. Yeah, Slayer, mm -hmm. Megadeth, uh, Alice, and, Alice and Chains got booed. Really? Yeah, the... they were the opening act. Think about that for a second. Or was it 92? Mm. No, it was 91. Okay, I, 91. I can't imagine. Alice in Chains being booed. Well, yeah. 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 Like, well, yeah, that's probably that it was. At that time, they were probably not that famous as they are like now. No, they're still a younger band at the time, but it's Slayer. Mm -hmm. Slayer's crowds are notoriously uh, brutal. And uh, so it's other bands? Excuse me? Towards other bands or like towards anybody else besides Slayer? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a full full, full tour mm -hmm. um, with oh. Alice in Chains. Mm -hmm. And they Alice in Chains was uh, the opening act. Um, Slayer was mm -hmm. the headliner. Megadeth yeah. was on the tour. Um, so, yeah, so they didn't enjoy the opener. <laughs> Correct. They had the the infamous Slayer chant. Okay, so let's move to the next question. So, like, first ever tour of your life was it with Skip Line, your the band you were in before <laughs> Chimera, yeah. or was it with Chimera? No, no, the that I guess you can't say it's full on tour, but we did like my first out of um out of uh state concerts i remember there was a and, situation yeah. with the skip lines first show you were into correct and um yeah we we did our first uh out of state gig in massachusetts and then rhode island the first show was great and then the second show we played in was rhode island and all of our equipment got stolen and we had to basically hitchhike but not literally but essentially hitchhike our way home from rhode island to cleveland which was about 15 hours total Ouch. and we were all crammed in the back of a bronco too and yeah pretty much uh ended that band right away and uh so like, that was on. that oh the, the this but, moral but from the from the van b carjacked or like, what, why exactly it ended up the band? Like, you were like, oh my well, god, we, if we the first show... Yeah, 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 yeah. we lost all of our equipment. Everyone's morale was just down the, the dumps. Um, I can You know, yeah, it, it was a pretty... It was a pretty tragic feeling, you know what I'm saying? Like, Yeah, I could imagine, like, especially... And we were young kids. This, is, this had to be 95... 96 mm -hmm. i was probably 18 19 years old when it happened so excuse me um yeah just kind of like a traumatic moment where you're like oh my god i've never been robbed i've never mm -hmm. had you know woken up and 
all of our equipment is stolen. So that's crazy. At that age, you're kind of like, maybe I should, maybe I should do something else with my life instead of music. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not going still, so well. you carried on. Correct, correct. Which is good because other ones wouldn't have Chimera if you wouldn't. Correct, correct, correct. So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, hey, what's up, Dutch Rocker? I see you're in there today. And Robert, I'm looking at your chat room. El uh looks like Austin from Justin. Pretty cool. Saying hello. I can see your room here. Yeah, we got people coming in. What's Look up, at that Clayton? funny. Clayton. <laughs> so, yeah, you've played, like, have you ever kind of how many shows in total you've played with Chimera? Like, probably, like, hundreds across the whole, like, how many continents? Have you ever even thought about like how many shows, how many continents yeah. you've played in total? Yes, yes. Um, I actually I don't have it near me, but um, forty eight states, five continents, um, and I want to say a couple hundred countries. It's probably more than like five hundred shows for sure. Closer to one oh, k, I think. Absolutely, like yeah. 1K. We toured. We we toured from the year 2000 all the way through 2014. Um, well, should be more than well 1K. over a thousand. Yeah, well over a thousand shows for sure. Absolutely, I don't have it. You know, we used to archive that stuff, um, and I'm sure it would be extremely possible um, to go back and and actually tally it all. But I certainly don't have the energy to do that. <laughs> I'm not going to be the guy that does that. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. So you've played a ton of festivals as well, like Soundwave, Ozfest, Download, Grass Pop. Which is the most memorable festival you played? Hmm. Definitely Download in 2007 because we had uh, a chance to play the main stage. Mm -hmm. And there were anywhere from, I don't know the official number, when we were playing, but I know the attendance for that day was well over 70,000. I think we maybe have lucked out and played to about half of that, um, which is still pretty amazing. To say and, the least. Um, yeah, yeah. It was just very nerve-wracking, and that's what, kind of why it's so memorable. There were so many people I actually started to get, it, it felt like tunnel vision, and I couldn't, like, I couldn't, there were so many people I could only focus on, like, a small patch of these people, and everything else just looked like, just washed out and it was just mm. couldn't get i was so like hyped but also so nervous i couldn't yeah. get into a groove and it took me till about maybe like track three or four where i finally started like okay i think i got this i think i got this but well, yeah it's just uh, there's so many memorable ones yeah half of the 70 k that's like oh my god about that that's that's cruel. like a thirty five thousand forty thousand yeah. thousand people somewhere that, around there that's freaking Absolutely. crazy so yeah, is are there any actual places you really wanted to play but you didn't manage to go there? Would have loved to have gone back to Japan. We got to go there once and it was just such a great time that I was I was like, man, I wish we could get more offers to go there. So it was I just kept wanting to go back to Japan. Um but as far as like some places that we didn't get a chance to go to, I don't believe so. Um I mean, we hit it. We hit pretty much everywhere. It would have been nice to, I think, to go to Russia just to see Russia. Uh, you know, the arc. Mm -hmm. I'm a I'm a big fan of architecture, and uh, you know that obviously has some fantastic oh, yeah. architecture that I've that you're not going to see really anywhere else. So when I when we were touring, I always like to travel to places that um, I'd never been to, and you know, experience the culture, walk around the cities, um, just kind of absorb what you know, what all makes us the same, but also what all makes us different. So, yeah. How many times have you been in, in Russia? With never. So that's what I'm saying. That's oh, like, like yeah, that you like... never, ever toured in Russia. Correct. That's probably Ooh. one place that I would have liked to have gone to. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to write it down. Well, I thought you were in Russia. So you were in Latvia, but you were not in Russia. There's something we, should, we can be proud of because usually <laughs> it's the other way around. But bad's right. like to Russia through and through, but barely ever play in Latvia. So actually coming to the right. show in Latvia, what are your memories from the show in Latvia? Like you were um, here I once. Don't know. I, you were yeah, here we came there once. with uh, 
Right. We came there with uh, Doff and Unearth and Throwdown, and that was a fun tour regardless, uh, just because, you know, we all got mm -hmm. along with each other really well. But uh, I don't remember so much about the show, just because shows just kind of tend to blur together unless there's something really wild about it. But I remember walking around the city center, and this mm -hmm. is actually in our Coming Alive DVD, and, I mean, stumbling upon, like, a beautiful uh, church that I want to say someone said was built in 1300s or something. It was, like, red, yeah. and it's, like, fantastic-looking cathedral uh, mm -hmm. or some location, but red, it was very that's... old. Oh, yes. I think uh, it was red. Yes. It's, if red, I think I even know which one you actually mean. It's on the way to the city center. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I just, know what you yeah, mean. I remember just looking at all this beautiful old architecture and being like, wow, this is like some some of the oldest stuff we had ever gotten to see. And, um, you know, because you're in the UK, some of that stuff from is from 2015. <laughs> it's like, oh, cool. Wow, brand new building. But when you go over <laughs> into Latvia, yeah. you're like, wow, there is some really really amazing beautiful architecture yeah. but then we just started laughing because we turned around and there was a tgi friday <laughs> oh we're like, okay if what? tgi fridays that is that is the old sound that is definitely the old sound if it's tgi fridays because i know the yeah. only place where tgi fridays is yeah there we is just actually... started laughing so hard because the it blend just makes sense yeah, yeah it's like, it's with like all the that blend old, of beautiful architecture mm -hmm. and the tgi fridays right yeah, that is. Quite I believe that made our. I believe that section made our DVD because we were all like, "What the hell?" I will need. To, <laughs> I will need to rewatch it because I'm really curious I to we check go to it out. Believe we a record store in Latvia too. I believe we went into a. Do you guys have like a big record store over in that area too? It was right, like across randoms on the other, like on the other side of the street. There is a. There was a big record store. Back. We yeah, don't we have it there. there. Hung out. We don't have no, it there anymore. Imagine. Like it was, yeah. I think it closed a couple of years ago. But yeah, we had like it was called Randoms. It was right across the street, like DJ Fridays and Randoms across the street. I think it was the biggest one that we had. <laughs> now they moved to a smaller location. Someone asked uh, Robert in the in the chat room asked if we stole the rug because uh, uh, Chimera were notorious for stealing rugs from <laughs> restaurants, chain restaurants. We stole rugs from Fridays, Applebee's, all these American restaurants, and we used them on stage so we didn't slip. You know how the stage, when you're mm. performing sometimes, if it's yeah. wooden, it'll get slippery. All the big bands use carpets. They'll bring in their own custom carpets. You know, you see Machine Head, they got giant Machine Head carpets, Lamb of God, same thing. Mm. We had TGI Fridays. We had <laughs> Applebee's. <laughs> all this ridiculous stuff. Do you have them still somewhere? Or like you, I don't gave him if, away, if anyone, throw him away. If anyone still has him, it's Rob uh, from our band. He uh -huh. he was the pack rat and still is, and the guy that kept like he would have. If anyone has him, it's him. Okay, because I, I believe some fans would be quite interested in getting a rug. I don't yeah. know. I, imagine new merch type signed rug. <laughs> right, 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 that right, would, right. That would be something. <laughs> Okay, so you said you've been to five continents. In yes. which continents do you think you had the most crazy fans? Which continents, which countries? I know a lot of us yeah, yeah. usually say Latin America has pretty crazy. It wasn't the same with you, or you'll yeah. name anybody else. Latin America, so everywhere is different, right? And they all have like kind of a different vibe, and mm -hmm. there's... A great things to be said about all of them. Latin America is definitely one of them. I kind of get the vibe for our band that Australia was huge for us. Um, mm -hmm. The fan base there tended to, uh, it's like weird to say like that's, that's where we're big, you know, like mm -hmm. the band's really popular in Australia. So when the, when the audience like really, really knows your music and even your deep cuts in the catalog, um like sing it alone yeah. over time yeah yeah exactly mm -hmm. exactly and we just always did really well there and um yeah exactly sheila's and blokes was a big song uh but uh the uh uh another one is when you mention latin america if i if i don't mention mexico like that mm -hmm. was definitely one of the craziest shows the first time we ever played in mexico that is the only location ever in the world that 
they they sang our guitar riffs. Not only did oh, they yeah. sing along with us, but they were like la 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 la. Yeah, I've uh, seen it happening. Like, like what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, I've seen that. They were happening. louder than the band. I think I've seen that happening with Parkway Drive on one of their. I think was it a DVD or a live show? They were actually singing out the solos and all the stuff. They're like you're all watching. Like, oh my god, <laughs> I've never experienced anything like this here on any show. People singing the song. That's like freaking crazy. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, I've never seen anything like it. So I, I, I would say hands down, that might have been like one of our, you know, best responses from a crowd ever would have been that first Mexico show. Which year was um, that? I'd, 2004. Okay. Imagine if you would come it back was, to there now. <laughs> uh, it, it was the last show that I had dreadlocks, which is hilarious. Uh huh. So, okay. So, next question: Did you like <laughs> probably you did you get a, get a lot of fan presence? Like, I know at meeting greets or just after the show meeting fans. All the time. Um, you know that's so funny you ask this because, um, I was gonna show my streamers this and I did I, I didn't yet. But this is an example of one of those things where mm -hmm. a fan, um, they like personally hand you this and they, it's like a handcrafted art piece where they Ooh. took our lyrics and photographs from the album. And I know it's not the easiest to see what mm -hmm. they did with it, but um, they construct stuff. You know, it means a lot to them. Mexico, we got like a ton of like, uh, coffee mugs and like just stuff that people made themselves or um you go to california everyone just gives you marijuana <laughs> like you just walk in and they're like here's a couple pounds hope this works for you <laughs> uh so it's it's all different depending uh, on where you are <laughs> okay but which one was the probably the most crazy present that you received the one that hmm. you remember, like the one that you remember like, like you'll remember till the end of time the one that you will tell your grandchildren about like one day oh, I got man, I this. I, I don't think I have one of those, unfortunately. Honestly, that book thing I just showed you, I've been carrying that around for 17 years. So Ooh. that's probably one of the cooler things. Like somebody just like I don't really even know what the hell it is. It's just a piece of like I can just tell this person spent a lot of time doing it um and looking through it. And like I don't really understand it's their sentimental value, but I was always like, whoa, like it's different than than the normal gifts you get. Yeah, you that know? is true. Do so. you remember where you got it? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, no clue. It like seventeen years is a long time. Yeah, man. that is true. Time. I can imagine. Yeah, especially when you've done it a few times now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I've done seventeen years twice now, at least. So. Yeah. Okay. So you've been on tour like probably with a good like dozen of bands. Which was the most fun band to tour with for you? Um, yeah, that's tough. Like, again, because like, we've toured with so many. We've had a great yeah. time. Like, I'd say like the bands we bro down with the most mm -hmm. would be easier for me to answer. Um, we definitely bro down hard within flames, Slipknot, um, Machine Head, Big Time, Fear Factory, Slayer, um, El Nino. Those are probably Ooh. the bands that Spine Shank that we toured with quite a bit and did very long runs with and just had a lot of fun with, you know, made good friends with them. These are people that like in these bands that I can, you know, some of the members you can still call or still talk to to this day, which is like, mm -hmm. you know, it goes just beyond like hanging out on tour, right? Yeah. So, but like, do you have any most crazy memories with any, like, well, probably you have crazy memories with all of the bands, but uh, like, can you pick one memory, one, like, one of the most crazy tour you ever did with someone? Or like, um, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, the, I'd say one of the most wild incidents we had was playing our hometown in Cleveland with Slipknot. I want to say there was about 6,000 people there. 
and we were popular by this point in our hometown. Mm -hmm. Like we had a lot of love for our band. So when we came out and started, we, we opened with power trip and within the first minute of the song, the crowd had gone so crazy that they snapped the entire front barricade <laughs> and, uh, it, and like basically the promoter and everybody was like, please stop playing. <laughs> like, this is bad. You know, like they are going way too crazy. Um, they're like, just, you got to stop. We got to fix this. Like people are going to get hurt. And I was like, Oh yeah, whatever. You know, like, but we were like, Oh my God, <laughs> you know, we were going crazy. Like wh how awesome is that? Um, so we had to spend like, I don't know, five or six minutes, uh, just talking to the mm -hmm. crowd while like, they're like trying to push everyone back. And this is thousands of people. Then they got to yeah. like, you know, get the barricade up, fix it. So like, meanwhile, our drummer at the time, his name was Ricky. He's just like trying to play like drum solos and stuff <laughs> to like entertain people. Cause we can't play metal, you know, mm -hmm. I can't, and I'm not a stand up comic, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> And I was in full on like kill mode, right? I wasn't ready for this yeah. to happen. Like I'm ready to go out and murder a crowd. You know what I mean? As a vocalist, yeah. you're like adrenaline boiling. Not, yeah, all that stuff. I'm not ready to be nice like how I am now. I'm ready to <laughs> fucking slice somebody's throat. And uh, so, but it was just cool. And then that night, um, you know, I felt on this big high, like, oh my God, we just crushed our hometown. Biggest show of our career in our hometown. I loved it. And the promoter, took me down the street the same night prince was playing mm -hmm. and he took me uh into the loge and we get to sit and watch prince play for a little bit and and here i'm on this high like i'm the biggest musician in the <laughs> world right and then uh we're sitting in the loge and prince sits down on a on a on a stool like a bar stool in the middle of a mm -hmm. stage with an acoustic guitar 20 some thousand people right he just hits mm -hmm. one one note, strums the note, and he goes, <laughs> I guess I should have known. And then you hear the 20,000 people go, by the way you parked your car sideways that it wouldn't last. You know, and I'm just yeah. like, I'm this big. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even close mm -hmm. to being <laughs> a cool musician just because I rocked my own crowd. But it was such a good, humbling experience. And like, wow, that is pure... Like Prince yeah. is the man. That is pure talent and pure charisma. And uh, and then that that night, just remember getting so drunk with the Slipknot guys mm -hmm. that I literally had Exorcist projectile vomit. <laughs> <laughs> it was just green, and it was green because uh -huh. we were drinking absinthe. Oh, so it's just like Bleh. ouch. <laughs> I don't want to remember my last time drinking absinthe. <laughs> no, Ooh, sir. It's not a good time. Not a good time. Yes, absolutely. But like talking about some European shows, did you have any crazy memories with any of the best? Like, for example, I don't know, getting wasted within Flames in Sweden. Oh, I wish we toured with uh, In Flames everywhere but Europe. Really? We toured with them in Australia. We toured with them in oh. Japan. We toured with them in the United States. It's like everywhere but there. Um, I don't even think we got on the same day festivals. Maybe a couple of them. Um, European festivals, mm -hmm. ah, my biggest memory on those is just like the crowds just being so awesome, right? Like the adrenaline when you're playing in front of five, 10, sometimes 25, 35,000 people, it's just, yeah. it's crazy. You can't beat it. And the other thing I, my biggest takeaway from European festivals that's so different is the variety of bands on some of them that you, you play. We did one where it was us. Lamb of God, Gojira. That sounds Ooh, normal. That sounds good. But then you're good. like, but then you add 50 Cent, Tori Amos, and then like mm. all these other bands that have nothing to do with our genres. Yeah. And you're like, this is a cool festival. Like, I, I'm, I'm technically playing with 50 Cent. What? You know, Amy Winehouse. Is it the like same these, stage like, or is it like different stages? There's multiple stages, uh -huh. of course. I'm not sure what stage we're on, comparatively speaking, to who other bands have in my memory. But this is, I think, somewhere in Finland. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, just diversity in the festivals. Even the metal festivals, you're not just like, we'll get like a Summer Slaughter tour, which is like, all right, you're going to get every deathcore and death metal band. Yeah. Whereas, you know, festivals exist like that, but we were always playing with like, 
hey, we might be on the same festival as Accept, like an old school band, and you might see uh, uh, Machine Head on there. You might also see, though, like, um, I don't know, uh, The Darkness, right? Like, and you're like, oh, okay. It, it's rock, you know, but it's not quite metal. So there's just a lot of diversity. And I just remember getting a chance to share the stage with bands I never dreamed I would be playing with Iron Maiden, Metallica, Slayer, yeah. Megadeth, Anthrax. Got to do it all. So I think that that's my biggest takeaway is just being able to play with some of those mm -hmm. bands and get off the stage and then go watch them on the same stage or something like that. It's just is a cr feeling you can't beat, right? And the camaraderie mm -hmm. where um you're you know i'm in catering and i look up and fucking jimmy yeah. page is sitting there and you're like what <laughs> am i really am i dreaming like pinch myself someone correct. please correct you can't you know what i'm saying those are the yeah. vibes like you're like you just can't make that shit up sitting sitting in catering talking to scott ian about david lynch movies for like two hours and having the oh. nerdiest conversation ever those are the types of memories I get from European festivals. It would never happen anywhere else. You don't, you just, sometimes you just don't get an opportunity to get paired up with bands and, and musicians like that. So yeah, that sounds absolutely crazy. So yeah, you were a part of sound of the underground tour for like three years in a row, right? So I believe they, well, you may be, you, you might be right because they did a European one. Yeah, you so did. I think you might be right. Yeah, in 2006, yeah. Mm -hmm. you did UK and Europe. 2005, you Correct. did the US. Yep. And 2007, you did US as well. Thank you. Yes. So what were the most craziest memories you have from those tours? Mm. Hmm. What was first, going on? First, yeah, the first sounds of the underground. That was the one with Guar, I want to say, right? It had to have been, I think Guar did it, mm -hmm. two of them anyway. But anyway, one yes. of the ones with Guar. Mm -hmm. 2005. Yeah, the first one we did with them. Well, I was a fan of Guar growing up, and I used to go to their concerts, and I used to love mm -hmm. getting all the the blood and cum or whatever they, what you want to call it that they spray all over the crowd. Um, and I uh, used to go to school like that. You know, I'd go into mm -hmm. school the next day in high school, like <laughs> still in Guar goo. Like, yeah, <laughs> I was there, man, you know. Um, so on that tour, we befriended the band and then, um, I just asked Dave, uh, the singer, I'm like, Hey man, can I get killed by you guys? <laughs> Will you guys kill me, you know, on stage? So, uh, he brought, he brought me up and just violated me in the most guar way ever. <laughs> by shooting a giant load of blood all over my face, just <laughs> nonstop repeatedly in front of a couple thousand people in, uh, in, um, uh, were you playing Canada, at that yeah. night as well? Or are you just, yeah, we played that night. Yeah. Yeah. We played the same. We, this was the whole tour. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So was it, so it was, it was one of the nights on the tour. Did you already play or you were supposed to play after? Ah, I see what you're saying. Um, because you had to wash off all the blood and shit. Yeah, I want to say I want to say we had already played. Yeah. I believe on that on that tour that we we rotated mm -hmm. bands like rotated or something, and I believe we hit before them that night. So yeah, okay. I didn't yeah. have to uh, I didn't have to go on stage in in Guar Cum. Because <laughs> <laughs> that would be imagine your fans seeing you like walk out on stage like this, like what the hell just happened backstage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it was fun. They have yeah. it's on the Sounds of the Underground DVD, and then the the Sounds of the Underground European tour. I remember two things about that. Most of us shaved everything but mustaches, <laughs> so we were just laughing at how we looked, you know, because everyone had a mustache, and um, and uh, we were playing the game Mafia a lot with Ooh. all the bands. So that was that took up ninety percent of our time. It was just every band, us, Unearthed, Madball. Uh, was all the remains on that as well? Yes. Um, we're just all playing um, mafia the whole time. Well, getting wasted. I don't think we did anything else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, you know, I'm not much of a wasted kind of guy, but a lot of other dudes are for sure. Yeah. Well, it's it's an inevitable part of music, I guess. It is. I mean, it's, I'm not saying I haven't. I obviously yeah. just told you a, a story where I did, but <laughs> yeah, I'm. 
I'm more the uh, the cannabis loner, stoner mm-hmm. guy, you know. Yeah, well, that's to each his own. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. <laughs> but yes, so coming, like, I'm thinking, what was the craziest thing you, like, if you combine all tours together, will you probably think that, the, like, the people singing along your raves, the craziest thing ever happening on tour, or you had, like, I don't know, Accidents, something even crazier than car being carjacked. <laughs> I don't know if that's, I don't know. Um, huh, that's always a tough question. You know, things, things that like happen on tour. Stay we on tour. That we never, yeah, yeah, well, not that, yeah. but so much that, uh, yeah, that's true too. But um, <laughs> in the sense of like, we were pretty fortunate, you know, our, our band wasn't, so we weren't chaotic. We were very mm-hmm. interested in work. We were very interested in our craft. We were very interested in making sure we, we could put on the best show. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, we were kind of boring. You know, lo- we played video games. Uh, we hung out on our bus mm-hmm. quite a bit. And the extent of our traveling was like walking through to city centers and getting food, you know, um, doing tourist stuff. So, you know, obviously, though, uh, things you go on a band, you go out with a band and it gets crazy or, you know, you have those nights, that kind of stuff mm-hmm. happens. We got in a bus accident. That's scary shit. You know, having your bus crash. Oh yeah. Um, that, that type of stuff, you know, like it, it, it when that happened, it like for, for the re- remainder of touring, you know, like anytime you'd feel a bus, like break, you're just like, mm-hmm. you, you tense up. So you could never get like that great sleep because you're just like, are we going to crash again tonight? Are we going to crash again tonight? Uh, How many so shows like in- that happen? How many shows in did that accident happen with the bus crash? So, like, how many remaining shows of the tour did you have after the accident? Quite a few. If we were on tour with Lamb of God in 2003, and it happened, like, I want to say within the first week of the tour. So, we had a whole, mm-hmm. like, five, six weeks left. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, no. It's no one fun. wanted to ride in the bus, you know? But we did, but we didn't. It was just scary. So, it's just things like that that happen, you know? There's obviously, like, we always would get like in shitty situations where, um, you know, just the touring logistics aren't to your favor. We were coming from Australia to Europe once and we had to do a, a layover in Dubai and we're in Dubai and all of a sudden they didn't want to let us bring our gear, even though we had like, uh, they wanted to charge us for the gear, but we had already packed it in Australia. (laughs) This is just a, a layover. Right. And, and, they're trying to they were trying to charge us tens of thousands of dollars for our gear so i literally had to go into like american asshole threatening mode and basically say here okay fine we're just gonna leave all the fucking gear right here in the lobby so our keyboard is sean z at the time he opens up his keyboard thing he goes here man have a keyboard just gives a keyboard to his random stranger and they're all like what do we do what do we do what do we do and they're like, just fine, just go, just go, just take your gear and get out of here. Just take your gear and get out of here. Like stuff like yeah. that happened to us. It was never anything like, oh, the whole band is, uh, you know, going to uh, prison because they wanted to, you know. So you were kill basically their wives or you something. were like you That's were other, offering to leave them like band. full, absolutely full backlight, like drums, yeah. uh, guitar combos, everything. everything. We were gonna leave it. We were gonna leave it right there at the ticket desk ouch yeah i can imagine they're like what is this shade yeah well yeah. they would have had guitars uh drums <laughs> keyboard stuff um you know yeah that's actually reminded me of the story i was told by the guys from we came as romans once how they were stalled at the russian border but they were coming from russia to play a gig in latvia basically because like the guys at the border couldn't understand what they're carrying with them while they're actually that was just their back line they're like okay do you have like uh, papers for this do you have papers for this they're like papers, i think please they were mm-hmm. late around like four hours probably so basically they yeah. like, had a light check and just hit straight hit the stage that shit happens all the time um what, but the funniest moment I ever had at customs was leaving Mexico. Before I left, I went into the gift shop, and they they were selling um, glass guns. So it's glass, clear glass, in the shape of a gun, 
filled with tequila. Who? And I'm like, oh, how, how very Mexican cartel of them. I'm going to buy this. So I buy it, and I put it in my backpack, and I run it through the scanner. And the TSA woman is like, um, <laughs> is this what I think it is? And she's like, sir, please step back. And they grab another you know, TSA rep. Mm -hmm. and they think it's a fucking gun. I'm like, are yeah. you kidding me? I bought this right there. This is a fucking glass gun with tequila in it. And they're like freaking out like, like, I, like I committed a crime. So that's the kind of mm -hmm. weird shit that happens in customs, especially to uh, dudes like us with tattoos and long hair. Yeah, the time. I exactly had a similar moment when I was actually breaking on an, an in-ears receiver. So basically, you know, the usual thing with the yep. antenna. And so I'm bringing it through the customs. Uh, like, I think I was just bringing it in the backpack. So basically I take like, I take off my laptop, all of this. I just put it on, uh, you know, like in this thing that go through the scanner. It goes through the scanner. They're like, excuse me, sir, can you please come here? What is this? Is It's a uh, in-ears <laughs> receiver. Like, do you think I'm going to trigger a bomb or something? They're like, please, yes, you, you can You can't go. say bomb. Yeah, you can't say bomb. And then they put you in the cuffs. Yep. Uh, yeah. Weird, weird, weird world we live in. But I'm like, literally, it's glass. You can see that it's tequila. It says tequila on a box. Mm. Like, what are you guys doing? What are you thinking? Yeah, this is insane. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, customs are customs, at least. They're trying they to keep are. us safe, hopefully. Yeah, <laughs> they do a terrible job at it. <laughs> <laughs> so, another question. What was the biggest technical difficulty you ever experienced during a gig? Do you remember something like this? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I don't remember which festival it was. Maybe it's with full force. I don't know, but it was a big festival like that. You know, we're talking like 20 some mm -hmm. thousand people and we're on the main stage. And uh, we used uh, uh, triggers on the kick drums. Mm -hmm. And um, for whatever reason, something got touched incorrectly. And instead of a kick drum sound coming out of the triggers, it was a ride cymbal. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. So our first song of double bass is a double ride symbol. <laughs> uh, I wonder if there's really, a record really bad. If there's a record of this, because that would be hilarious to hear. I believe it exists. Yeah. I um I'll have to find it. I know it exists because I remember we we watched it and we're like, what the fuck? <laughs> like I just Andal's alone though. You know, he's trying to play and it's like he's a snare, you know. <laughs> Ding 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 ding. But it does go into your in ears like that sound of the kick drum, or you didn't have the kick drum. So we weren't we we weren't wearing in ears, but that's another that's another problem of ours is once too because we don't wear in ears because at one show, um, we're playing and you know I can't hear my vocals in my in ears, so I'm like turn them up, turn them up, turn them up, and they're cranking them and cranking them. Sound guys like it's maxed, it's maxed. I don't hear them at all. I don't hear them at zero, nothing. Anyway, so I just rip them out. Long story short, the sound guy three songs later is like, dude, you know, Andal, same thing. Our packs were switched. So every time <laughs> I'm asking for vocals to get turned up, oh they're getting turned up in his wedge. Ouch. <laughs> in his in-ears. And we just were like, no, well, that's never happened again. <laughs> no more in-ears. So like you played the rest of the time without in-ears, like? Yeah, we, ne we were a band that never played to a click or in-ears. Oh, okay. I mean, yeah. the in-ears, I wouldn't say never. We only use the in-ears for like three to four months when we were trying to get the hang of it. It just never worked out for us. Okay, because like I can't even imagine playing without in-ears, even though, okay, our music is the type of music when you have to use in-ears. Otherwise, like you have to play to a click. Otherwise, you're fucked completely. We have never played to a click and except for one show. And the only show we ever played to a click track was the very last show we just did. And the reason, the only reason we played to the click track is because the video that I created with uh, Spikusa, our keyboardist, and I did all the video content. Mm -hmm. But I'm sitting there recording, or I'm creating all the, I'm doing all the edits to the song. And as I'm doing it, I'm th not thinking to myself, I'm like, oh shit, like, this has to be on a click. Otherwise, it's never going to sync up. Like, specific hits, I'm, like, making the video do certain things. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, if we're not on a click, this will never line up. 
Oh yeah. So we had to uh, we had to play to a click the very for the very first time, but none of us except for our drummer uh, who we used uh, Austin Diamond from Devil Driver for the show. He uh, he was the only one that wore the in ears. So we still for us it was still business as always. It just we just sounded tighter. That's all. Yeah. Well. Like- at least if at least a drummer does the rhythm according to the click then you'll be fine but right yeah. so like you were touring a lot did you do any kind of exercises to like save your vocals or you were just going purely like purely full I, mode i just go for it yeah i just go for it so like you're um, not doing if the, any if the set mm-hmm. excuse me if the set is heavier in melodic songs that we have so let's say I have to do down again that night or some parts mm-hmm. that I'm like, I'm just not the best at doing cleans live uh, when you're in the moment. Like, uh, it, it's I'm just not great at it. You know, there's some dudes like Howard Jones that just they yeah. just fucking nail it. I'm not that dude. So <laughs> I, I'll spend time warming up. Um those types of vocals like i'll do the chorus of down again a hundred times or something before we go on but normally i just every set i'm doing on the stream i just you know like i just go for Mm -hmm. it now and uh the more practice um the better but i've never been vocally trained um except for for cleans because i felt that that's where i needed the most improvement and the most understanding that's a skill Mm -hmm. set and not one that i was naturally gifted with so it's something that I should have taken more time to learn mm-hmm. uh, at the earlier stages of my career. And I didn't pick it up until probably 2007, 2008 is when I went to see Melissa Cross and Ooh, she started yeah. to help me with the cleans. Yeah, but Melissa. most people go to her for screams, but I went to her for, for cleans. And well, actually, the ability to control the screams and singing. So that's kind of, you know, a lot of people are either good at one or good at the other. And it's, it's not always easy to find someone that's good at both, right? So unless they have been trained or maybe they're just naturally gifted. So I think yeah, Melissa so Cross is like singing. yeah, Melissa Cross is like a legend amongst metal singers. Absolutely. I, I, I like I don't even remember how many people I've seen were actually visiting. I even know one vocalist uh, that was like local from Latvia. Even she went to US to actually take lessons from Melissa Cross. She was even also posting pictures with Melissa Cross. I myself was actually watching Design of Screaming, the DVD she released to learn breathing techniques because like before I actually watched that, I was damaging my voice after every rehearsal. I was like, oh my God, I can't speak. Mm -hmm. So I never had the issue Mm -hmm. with that, um, thankfully. But when I would try to sing a lot, then that's when Mm -hmm. I started having the problems. Uh, Venom Hammer, I can confirm uh, Howard is built like a baseball bat. (laughs) He has a baseball bat in his pants. <laughs> it's like, he's like, hey, man, let me show it to you. And it just comes out like an arm. It's like a third arm just like plops out. <laughs> Howard's very, yeah. Howard is notorious for whipping his Johnson out on, uh, in when anyone asks. <laughs> True story. Okay. Yeah, so <laughs> you're like, yeah. uh, I didn't want to talk about Howard Johnson's <laughs> just, penis, so let's totally. move on to the next topic. <laughs> yeah, like, okay, imagine if uh, I will ever get Howard Jones to come, that would be actually quite nice. But, like, okay, remember that very first episode we were talking about your penis with Mark? <laughs> what can you say about it? <laughs> Did I just call him Howard Johnson, by the way? That's, that was an actual Freudian slip. <laughs> Imagine your reaction if somebody will tell you they were discussing your Johnson on stream. How, 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 how would you? Would mi- I don't think he'd mind, and I think it's, it's probably business as usual for Howard. <laughs> okay, so the question I find a lot of people like hard to answer like two questions song you like to play live the most a song you hate to play live the most after all these mm-hmm. years um i don't we we were having a hard time like playing the song dead inside for a while just because Ooh. it was the song that was on farm club and that kind of it felt like, you know, one of those old embarrassing high school photos to us for a while. But now the time has passed. I don't really have any of those types of feelings anymore. 
where I'm like embarrassed mm. of certain songs in the catalog. I feel like mm. it's all at a level now where I can appreciate it again. So mm. back in the day, it would have been that. Now, pretty much everything is fair game. Options was definitely a song I, I didn't like, but now that I'm singing it on the stream, I'm like, this song kind of fucks, so I'm all right with it. Why um, didn't you like it? I just didn't feel like it came out how we had anticipated it to, and it just, I don't know. I felt like it it just was generic. That would be the best, best, oh, okay. uh, best. you know, I just didn't feel like it. Yeah, yeah, I think it it's the same with to... every band. Like, I know Phil yeah, from All That Remains. Yeah, Phil from All That Remains, he said, like, he hates playing Six now after all these years, even though this is probably the most popular All That Remains song. Right. Yeah, I'm going to sing it for him. I'll take over for him. <laughs> I will have it. We're, I keep saying we're going to have a six off, and I'm, this week I will yeah. do it. Not coming up week, I got to do it. Um, I kept saying I'm going to scream that song. But um, yeah, wow, he helped I, me get on Twitch, so shout out to Phil. And, oh, yes. Uh, Phil is a freaking he, legend. He, uh, he, he, talked, he talked to me. We... uh. We've been chatting quite a bit and uh, before sure. beforehand just to, uh, you know, he helped me like show me the ropes before I ever started streaming. So it was really cool of him to take his time to do that. Yeah, it's good that he actually did. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I'm having a blast with it. I think there was another question in there before we started talking about Howard Jones's cock, but uh, <laughs> I, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> it was about vocal exercises. <laughs> Oh, it, it, yeah, it, it kind of switched <laughs> to from yeah. actually like saving your voice on tour to Howard Johnson. Howard jo we, can yeah, still yeah, keep, yeah, yeah. we keep calling him Howard Johnson though, not Howard Jones. Yeah. <laughs> this is what happens. It's like he's just sitting there and then it's just yeah. like it just drops yeah. down and starts flopping around like this, you know. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, no, mu yeah, I didn't really do much, much warming up, and uh, to uh, end on that <laughs> vocal training with Howard Johnson. Howard Johnson, yeah, exactly. Oh my God, how did you want to good representation? I mean, this is a good representation. I mean, it's yeah. phallic. It might not be long <laughs> enough, but I mean, it's probably <laughs> thick enough. <laughs> uh, All right. Okay, so yeah, and the song you like to play live the most. Oh, um, man, I really like uh, Wrapped in Violence. It was on our last album. It's one of the later mm. deep cuts on the, on the track, but I just love playing it. Um, every time we ended with it, I was like, fuck, like, that's, that's just the coolest way to end a show. So it was one of our later catalog, catalog mm. songs that I wound up liking the most. But uh, before that, um, you know, it was always fun to... The, to excuse me, to do the dehumanizing process because that's where I did the Metal Moses stuff and always got the crowd mm -hmm. going the craziest, so. Yeah, 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 yeah. I actually lost my freaking thought I wanted, that I wanted to. Oh, I wanted to ask, how often are you playing it on stream? So uh, on the evenings, Monday through Thursday, I stream some concert vocal sets, sometimes mm -hmm. guitar stuff as well. And now I have it set up where I put up over a hundred songs in there that that fans can request, mm -hmm. and uh, so I think I did. I started with dehumanizing yesterday. Uh, mm -hmm. That was the first song that somebody had requested, so I played it yesterday. Um, Wrapped in violence. Mm -hmm. I want to say we did it like last week. Um, okay. So it's uh, it's pretty much mm -hmm. every um, whatever the fans come up with now, and uh, try to just. Mm -hmm. I'm enjoying all the songs. Like a lot of these songs I haven't sang and you know, some of the ones that they're asking me to sing, I haven't sang in years or ever live. Uh, Impending mm -hmm. Doom is another song of ours that um, I never got a chance to sing live, but always wanted to. And now I've gotten to do it twice on stream. And mm -hmm. I'm like, man, this is awesome. So it, it's really cool that I'm, that I'm able to kind of get to do that you know you don't have to sit there and worry about a band learning the song for a couple of weeks or yeah, you just do it yourself basically it having song. lyrics yeah. on screen yep. easy as it that just, all right play it yeah mm -hmm. and then like now i'm jumping into covers and it's fun too because mm -hmm. people ask me to throw some cock. random covers out there like i did tupac yesterday i'm like whoa <laughs> i didn't think anyone was gonna ask me to do tupac fuck yeah let's do it so it's whoa. it's just we just have a good time on there and it keeps me um in good mental spirits and it's it's helping me get reconditioned i i had kind of taken way too long of a break on music so yeah, uh, like it's helping me get reconditioned. don't forget to mention swinecock 
Oh yeah, best <laughs> song ever. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, let, next time I'm coming to your stream, I definitely want to hear you sing six by all the remains. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I got to <laughs> learn it. I mean, I'm pretty much there. I, I I'm about ninety percent with it. So by next week, I'll have it. Okay, good. So like what do you think is the hardest thing about being a touring musician so like i know that your drummer anvils actually left the band because like he wasn't too enthusiastic like constantly being on the road at least that's what wikipedia says so like what was the hardest thing for you like i don't know like physically mentally i think it's a mental game the being uh, being away from loved ones and being far away that's not easy um my better half suffers from severe Crohn's disease. So there was a lot of medical issues mm -hmm. going on that made things hard as well, because you're very concerned, you know, yeah. about uh, your loved ones. But when you're mm -hmm. on tour, you are literally like in such another universe almost where the real world, it, it doesn't almost, it's like, not that it doesn't exist, but it really doesn't. Mm -hmm. So you're like constantly fighting this, um dichotomy of trying to be in two places at once with your mental game and the mental game obviously you want to be with your loved ones yeah but then you got to go play a show in front of thousands of people that you care about that as well you know that's yeah. your passion and when you think about life, it so. these people like they came to see the show they like they don't know about what's going on in real Correct. life so like they don't know they want to see a show they want to see you fucking destroy it and it's like, but you might be mentally in a completely different state. Like mentally, you are back home. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So that's difficult because you wanna you wanna give the best show ever for the fans, but you also wanna be there and be supportive to your loved ones. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a that's a struggle. Like the show itself is great. Mm -hmm. The other twenty three hours of the day are just I could take them or leave them. Right. I don't need to be anywhere <laughs> except at home. So that's the tough part. Yeah. So, like recently, Rob mentioned the possible Chimera reunion. What can you say about that? Like, I know that their plans were put on hold due to COVID, but after the whole shit show will be over, do you have any actual plans on putting up like a show, maybe a tour or something? We don't. We actually talked the other day maybe like two weeks ago we had like we were all like zoomers right we jumped on zoom meeting looking like a bunch of old men so we spent about five minutes discussing the future where we left we are our answer basically is there are too many unknown variables for us to spend the energy on doing anything active mm -hmm. we do not feel confident that the covid situation will end anytime soon and everyone's personal life is too involved for us to take time away for what ifs. Yeah, so basically, like you, like, do you think you might come back to this thought after everything will be over? Like, hopefully, it will be over eventually. Yeah, I mean, that's it's not out of mm -hmm. it's it's not out of the realm of possibility. But mm -hmm. as of right now, we are like definitely not doing anything because. Yeah. It's well, right now it's nobody. kind of meaningless because nobody knows like you know there are a lot of tours that are being like moved from this year to next year like to I don't know to winter to spring to summer to even next autumn but nobody actually knows like considering the whole situation if it's even going to be possible to make them happen. Correct. So for us, since we're not a band that all lives to get in the same state, mm -hmm. only three of us uh, live together. We have an unknown variable in the drummer situation. You know, we either oh. use somebody on loan from Devil Driver or we figure something mm -hmm. else out, which uh, we don't really want to. So mm -hmm. if it can't be Andals because of his health problems, then the next mm -hmm. choice is Austin. So if bands do start touring next year, Devil Driver is definitely going to go out. We're not going to be taking Austin. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just too much to think about, too much, too many variables. And nobody, the, the, the biggest thing is nobody has a drive to do it, right? Oh, yeah, like, that, that is... everyone's like, oh, fuck that, I'm staying home. <laughs> like, it's like, I'm, like, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. I've got Switch now. Yeah. Why should I go anywhere? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't feel that way when, when I said that. It has nothing yeah. to do with Twitch. But, uh, th but I do get that, a little bit of that, because I can mm -hmm. perform, I can sing these songs, I can have an interaction with fans, I can entertain. Um, 
but the energy level so at least there's something there's so, there's yeah the energy level is nowhere near obviously mm -hmm. but there at least there's something that we can all celebrate with during these times but i i yeah. none of us are confident maybe hopefully we're all wrong um but none of us mm -hmm. in the band are confident that 2021 will will be um better a, a place a place where we we are possible to thrive where it's possible mm -hmm. for our band to thrive because of the unknown variables and logistics we just assume to hey let's talk to each other again in mm -hmm. six months see what's what the world's like you know it's more like that do you actually meet up like with the camera members yeah we we did the last time we did though was right Right uh, before the first COVID lockdown, um, I want to say it was uh, February or March, uh, right at the beginning of March, and we all went to breakfast and hung out and had a good time, and then we all Zoomed the other, I don't know, like two weeks ago, a week ago. Yeah, but like, are you close so. or are you just uh, like sometimes hang out and that's it? Well, I see Jim once a week. So our bass player, Jim, or not once a week, but once a month at least, he cuts my hair. Oh. my barber so oh, okay i also did his I, I did his website and so i see jim all the time rob mm -hmm. uh i see you periodically he only lives about five minutes from me but he's been very busy building a new studio mm -hmm. and then when he's not doing that he has to be basically stay at home teacher and parent because of the covid situation mm -hmm. you know schools were closed for a while and he had to do homeschooling so such a such a busy life um and then Nobody else lives here, so I don't get a chance mm -hmm. to see them. But uh, I talk to them all the time on text and, and messages uh, daily. So okay, that is good. So basically, do you have any advice to upcoming bands about touring? Like, what should they expect? What should they avoid? Like the mistakes you made when you were just starting out and going on tours. Um, definitely learn a lot about finance. Like have a fiscal conservative in the band <laughs> that understands finance. Um, if you have somebody that understands finance really, really well, you can make things work at at extremely low numbers. And if you have people that are, um, you know, willing to make sacrifices financially for the greater good, um, to invest further into the career of the band then I think that's your best and only shot of making it. And money is the only thing that's going to make this machine uh, go go around. And yeah, good good point, Justin. Get a good lawyer and own all your shit. Own all your yeah. stuff. Don't You don't need to sign to anybody anymore. And if you do, make sure like you get a piece of it. Uh, realize it's your product. Realize people are paying to see you and paying to see your product. So do what you can do. Um, to make it a very operable business. It doesn't mean you have to treat it like a corporation and, you know, like sell out. It just means that you you need somebody in the band that understands two plus two is four and you guys only have a dollar right now. Even though you're trying to make it look like four, you only have a dollar. So you got to like have that person in the band that's mm -hmm. financially savvy and everyone needs to respect and listen to that person because then that's that's going to be the key is is the money. Or unless you just yeah. blow up and make so much money, it doesn't matter. <laughs> who was that financial <laughs> then, then person? Lay off, then, then lay off the mm -hmm. drugs. Yeah, who was that financial <laughs> person for you? Was it you? Was it Rob? Was it somebody else? Definitely not me. So that's why I'm I'm be the first to give the advice is because I learned <laughs> learned from my mistakes. But uh, uh -huh. no, Rob Rob was no one. No one was a financial person in the band. Mm -hmm. But Rob is the guy that basically you know, helped with the accounting of it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, okay, this tour brought in X amount. Here's what we spent. Um, here's the, you know, the, what commissions need to be paid. And then here's what's left over. So mm -hmm. for the basics of how much things cost, how do we spend it? You know, that's what Rob was the guy that took care of that. But I'm talking like someone that can like, mm -hmm. that's someone that knows finance, like, Oh yeah. shit! This is what they're offering us. This is realistically what we should be spending, whereas we would just spend. Yeah, because I think. Oh, this is what yeah. we're making. Spend that, you know. I think nowadays, like most of the bands, they're basically, you know, like they try to make this more as a like they treat music more as a hobby, and a lot of people are just not ready to, you know, like 
invest uh, like that much money because like uh, even a lot of musicians that i personally know that are fine like with playing a couple shows maybe a month at home but like going on a lengthy tour touring like two three even four weeks which is basically not that much considering like bands tour for months for like you can spend like a whole year doing an album cycle and they're like thinking oh my god like, like that requires too much investment like no 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 no, I'm not. I'm not earning that much to invest that much, and they're not even like considering any possibilities, anything. We didn't have that mentality. We were young. We were in our twenties, and we were just. We would. Some of us, if not all of us, still lived with our parents when we were starting. So it was like, mm -hmm. who gives a shit about money? We just wanted to get big. We just wanted to go on tour. We just wanted to like you know get on the same stage as our friends' bands. Money was the least of our concern. And then the band like actually started making good money, but we didn't understand how to capitalize on that, right? Mm -hmm. We go in and spend it on tours and make sure we're comfortable. Rammstein gets paid and they build their own warehouse and their mm -hmm. own like street and their own, you know, headquarters. There's very much different things going on with that band and how they invested then in back into themselves versus us. And that's kind of what I mean, like having someone that's extremely savvy and knows knows how to make money someone with a vision like, i know you hear that stuff about rammstein and you're like whoa you know yeah, well, they took their first advance and basically put it all back into themselves and owned everything and they still do like i've heard that trivium are actually building a warehouse now for correct like there's another you know? that's a smart band that is a very smart band always have been yeah so you you did tour with trivium right yeah, quite a few times. We took them on one of their first tours ever. Who? Actually, I think we did take them on their first tour ever. Like in the U.S. or outside the U.S.? It was in the U.S. Okay, that is cool. It's actually That's actually always like I was really amazed when bigger bands were actually helping out smaller bands with tour because that's not, not, like, not a thing that usually happens here. Even though, like, mm. I think we only have one big band signed to a major label in, like, in the whole mm. country. Yeah, but yeah. I, I was always admiring, like, when you're actually helping out people. So, I, like, we should have some user questions. Let me quickly go through them and see what our people have actually asked us while we were talking. Okay, so one question regarding fans gifting your stuff. Have you ever kept contact with any fans after the shows? Like they were gifting you stuff and like did any of the fans actually later become became your friends? So a good majority of my friends I met through the band and some of my best friends I met through the band. Mm -hmm. So I have been in contact with some of the oldest Chimera fans. Um we used to have a message board when we started back in the late nineties and there's at least a dozen of those people that I'm still friends with. And like, when I say friends, I mean like, yeah, I'll text them, you know, like it's not like, you know, I recognize mm -hmm. that they're a fan for 20 years and it's not what I mean. Like these are like, mm -hmm. Hey, check out, you know, this new episode of whatever show, send each other text about it, you know, just like any friend would. So so I'm very grateful mm -hmm. for that. And it's not just because they gave me gifts. It's just we met them yeah. and we shared commonalities and um, just had a similar uh, set of interests and or mindset or whatever mm -hmm. it was. You know, you just kind of have that natural, you meet somebody and you're like, yeah, you, you just kind of know, right? And that's how I feel like I've met a lot of our, our fans mm -hmm. and that became friends. It's just kind of an internal, like, oh. Yeah, I like you. You're a cool dude. Yeah, so basically, it just clicked. Just they, there yeah. you go. You said it best. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. What else do we... You met so many big names in rock and metal. Did anyone leave you completely starstruck? Uh, Jerry Cantrell from Alice in Chains. I, he, walked, he just walked by once, and I was like... <laughs> I couldn't do anything about it. I was like, I was like mush. I got nervous. Just from him walking yeah. by. A, yeah. Now, a funny one to kind of do the complete opposite of that, where I almost mm -hmm. got starstruck. Um, we were doing the Metal Hammer Awards, and like you're walking mm -hmm. backstage, and like they have all the presenters kind of lined up, and I was mm -hmm. like getting placed in the line for, for my presentation. And I'm like, 
oh my god, it's Will Ferrell! I get so excited. It's a fucking Will Ferrell! Oh no, it was the drummer of Red Hot Chili Peppers. I'm like, oh. <laughs> well, I, I got bummed. <laughs> I was like, ah. Eh, whatever. You were just, just actually jazzman. remember, the, like, <laughs> on, where was it actually? I think it was on Jimmy Kimmel's show when they were actually made a drum right. battle between Will Ferrell right. and the drummer of Red Hot Chili Peppers. But they definitely look so alike. I was like, okay, that is interesting. Man, in person, in person, yeah. Like, I literally thought, like, oh, <laughs> it's fucking Will Ferrell. <laughs> nope. Nah, it's just the drummer of the Chili Peppers. Nah, who cares? <laughs> Not that interesting. <laughs> have you ever met like all the guys from the Chili Peppers? Like, have you ever uh, toured no, together or hang never out? Toured with them or played with them? But I do have a funny story about John Frusciante. Uh, oh, okay. I guess uh, we. This is one of the few times I did drink. I <laughs> was really drunk at the Rainbow, which is a a big hangout for musicians and bands in Los Angeles. Okay. You don't know who you're going to run into at that place, right? Like Lemmy used to sit there every day. You, you would see Lemmy all day, every day. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, I'm in the bathroom taking a piss and I look over and it's John Frusciante taking a piss. I'm like, mm -hmm. I go, whoa, you're that dude. And he looks at me, he goes, whoa, you're that dude. <laughs> that, was and, uh, that was it. So you did it. Actually, yeah. figure out which dude was. I don't think he knew dude. who I was. There's no way yeah. in the hell he knew who I was. <laughs> <laughs> but still, like he thought. Yeah, maybe he thought uh, I was the drummer of Sepultura. Okay. Did you ever had any pre or post show superstitions or rituals? Um. I yeah, I used to just like to listen. It would depend on the tour, right? Every tour was different. Like one tour, one of the Sounds of the Underground's tour with Every Time I Die, I had Crunk Hour, where me and the singer of Every Time I Die would listen to nothing but 80s rap and <laughs> uh, drink out of those pimp cup goblets. And we would just, <laughs> just pretend we were rappers for an hour before we'd go on stage. I, you never know. Uh, one, one, one tour, I got way into like, we, I got really weird. And I started like putting white sage and like trying to like get rid of the spirit, bad spirits on the stage. I was just way on too many psychedelics in that period of my life. I'm thinking I was going to get like the evil spirits off stage. And I did that before a big show. And the first song, our guitarist, Matt, jumped off and uh, he, he, he landed on my ankle. So I stopped Ouch. trying to white, white sage the, the stage. <laughs> that, that probably was painful. Absolutely. I, I, I was on crutches for a week. Okay, let me see. If there would be a movie called The Life of Mark Hunter, who would portray you and what topics would you like it to cover? So some people say that Michael Shannon kind of looks like me or the other mm -hmm. way around. The dude that played... Uh, to actually Google that. General Zod from... Uh, Superman, Man of Steel, rather. Well, with in the a, eyes, maybe. Yeah, well, <laughs> with a little bit of adjusting, you know what? Yeah, he would have to gain yeah. like twenty pounds. <laughs> uh, okay, it, it could yeah, work he, actually. He's he's very funny too, so he could pull off the like angry but comical. You know, I think it'd probably be close to like American Psycho, where you're kind of <laughs> laughing, but also like, is this evil? <laughs> is this a horror movie or a comedy? That's probably, you know, that's a good, good. Yo, no, good I, call. I actually, I start to see the similarities between, between you and Michael Shanta when I look at it. Yeah, they're there. Oh my God, we love. We got a long question from Mr. Dutch Rocker. Aside from missing yeah. home and family, what is the hardest part of touring? Aside from that. Yeah, aside from um, that. Um finding a place to use the restroom, especially when you have IBS. So if you're like me and you have a colon of a uh just that just hates your life and hates everything about you and just wants to destroy you, uh waking up in the middle of nowhere or in a festival. And you're like, uh, where do I shit? 
Where do I go? Oh my God. Where am I going to go shit? Where do I do? What do I do? What do I do? So where the hell do I run around to find a sh place to ship? And then sometimes you wake up in a, in a city mm -hmm. and you're just like, it's just buildings everywhere. You know, you, you're just, just, you're disoriented. This is before like Google maps, you know, or anything mm -hmm. like that. You're just like, where the fuck am I? What country am I in? Uh, and all you got to do is, is just try to find yeah. somewhere to take a shit. And man, that can be very, very stressful. <laughs> That's I probably can, the worst part. I can imagine. <laughs> like, okay, so another question. Your favorite food during the tour? Like, I know that during the tour, you often you don't have time to get like proper food. You're eating like junk food and like all kinds of, yeah. I don't know, pre-made stuff that you can just like, I don't know, like you probably toured in a nightliner. I believe so. You sure. had a fridge, so like that you can like stack with something. But what was the usual yeah. and your favorite thing that you were eating while on tours? So one of the smart things our band did was we just we bought a crock pot, and we would uh, go to the grocery stores mm -hmm. and make our own food. And so you could buy <laughs> like a nice roast and some vegetables, mm -hmm. potatoes, and just let it sit in the pot all day mm -hmm. and cook all day. Or you can do like yeah, like chilies. Or so making our own food was probably the coolest thing. And we did it everywhere, all over the world. We would buy like skillets and just cook uh, for ourselves on the bus. And, um, oh, but yeah. as far as like experiencing other food, uh, the most incredible food I had was in Lisbon, Portugal, some steak right next to the venue we played in. It was so tender. I was able to cut it with a plastic fork. Who? Um, I was just like, this is heaven. It was so good, so good. Um, <clears throat> Japan has amazing food. Uh, South America has wonderful food. Um, I would say the worst mm -hmm. food is just England. Sorry, um, <laughs> but the worst food is in England, and the only good food you get in England is when you go to an American restaurant or you go to Nando's, which is the South African chicken place. Uh, yeah, man. Whew. Everywhere else, mm -hmm. like I'm, I'm good. But I I eat hardly anything but McDonald's and Nando's in the UK because I don't like Indian food. Mm -hmm. That's that's what's huge over there. So oh, yeah, I think Indian food is huge in a lot of places. Even here, here yeah, we do have. Maybe it's not that big here, but like we're big with kebabs. That's what that's what we got a lot of oh, here. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't fuck with those. I mean, they're okay mm -hmm. at like you know one in the morning and there's nothing else mm -hmm. to eat. But yeah. Okay, so what else do we have? Did your group have any problems with internal organization? Whatever. Uh, can you be a little more specific on that? What do you mean? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out. So I suppose the person means like uh, organizing the work within the band, like the music writing process. Uh, so how was like? Oh, did we ever? Did we ever argue? Is that the well? Yeah, well, course. that's obviously that all the best yeah, yeah, argues, yeah. but every like... day. Um, no. Um, yeah. Everybody had kind of everybody had their own role and did a good job at it, right? So I was kind of the dude that um, talked to everybody in the industry. Um, I'm the guy that talks to the record label. I'm the guy that talks to the agent, the the manager. Um, kind of the voice of the band mm -hmm. both you know on stage and off rob you know did a lot of the stuff with the finances like i said but mm -hmm. also was very um integral in getting the band together to rehearse and making sure that the rehearsals were prepared organized mm -hmm. and um that they were successful <laughs> and led to people mm -hmm. were playing their shit correctly um so and then like mm -hmm. jim was really good with the fans, right? He's always the guy that's out hanging with the fans when maybe we're all doing interviews or sleeping or dealing with personal shit. He was always out there for hours a day hanging with the fans and was, was basically like the fan liaison. And uh, Matt was very, he was like that, but with the bands that we tour with, right? He's like the, he's the guy that's broing down with all the bands and making sure, um, that you know we're being represented in the party mm -hmm. sector of the tour okay. <laughs> uh you know he's the one drinking with the bands mm -hmm. and and 
Um, then Spacuza mm -hmm. was uh, integral with helping mm -hmm. on merchandise and website stuff. And but at the end of the mm -hmm. day, like Chris, Rob, and I shared collective duties in the overall overseeing of the band and the and the the masterminds. This is how it's gonna go? Yeah, the masterminds behind it. I'm definitely the the puppet master, but I've let mm -hmm. I've lessened I've lessened that grip more and more over the years. You know, like who who what I was yeah. trying to run and or control in 2003 versus in 2013 completely different. Mm -hmm. So another question, like, are you feeling if a band needs to, like if a band does plays as a support? You must connect with the crowd afterwards and watch the main show, especially when you're just starting out. Were you doing that? Oh, all the time. And then not, not just starting out the whole career. We always watch the bands that we toured with. Because like I know a lot of bands were actually, you know, like they toured together, but then they just might like watch the other band said like a couple of times that they just go and do their own business. But for me, it was always interesting to see other bands, like, you know, to see what I can learn from other bands, like their stage presence, their communication yeah, with, the, with the crowd, what they're doing. Yep. Same with me. I, I really enjoyed learning. That's, I looked at it as, you know, as school, but there, there's just some, obviously there's some instances where you just can't do that, where like, Let's say on Sounds of the Underground, for example, you know, you're touring with the, on that tour alone, there's probably 20 bands or something. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're just not even there yet when the opening bands are playing. Yeah. Then, then you're doing press all day, so you can't watch anybody. And then you play your set. And then after that, you want to eat, you want to take a shower, then you got to meet your fans, then you got to do your life thing. And you've seen nobody. You've not watched mm -hmm. a single band. It's because of life in the way so it's not every day but i'm definitely not going on a tour and not catching at least a set or two or hopefully more of every band that we're on on a tour with you know i've never not not seen a band that we've toured with it's basically like when you can't do it you do it when you can't do it but you can't do it yeah exactly and then there's some where you're like you're doing everything you can to try and watch it like slayer <laughs> you're like i don't want to miss it even though it's the 30th time you've seen him this this in the past six weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you ever meet Dimebag or Vinnie Paul while touring? Yes. Uh, we played with Damage Plan a couple times, and I got to meet Dimebag in OzFest 2003. Dime and Vinnie came to Wisconsin, of all places, to play Walk with Disturbed. Ooh. And I got to uh, play it with them and jump on stage and sing and um then met Vinny, uh met dime before that he was super cool we got to go to the pantera strip club a couple times and uh you know Vinny was always there as the host and just super cool always let the bands in for free um so very cool they had like their own strip house yeah they had, it's called the clubhouse um Ooh. dime and Vinny bought a strip club i want to say early 2000s and every band hung out there after a dallas show it was oh awesome. God. They play fucking metal in there, you know. It's just that's I didn't uh, do it. That's amazing. Yeah, you it's bring your own booze as well. Uh, the Texas Ooh. laws, right? So they would uh, come in and uh, bring you. You could bring in all the alcohol you wanted, and just sit there and uh, watch watch some some naked chicks while <laughs> listening to metal with the guys from Pantera. They were always there. Oh they god. were always there. What could actually be better? Oh my god. <laughs> Okay, so not much. Having toured with Slipknot, how would you feel about being a part of a nice, pe nice piece band of crazy mad guys? Uh, I I don't think I would enjoy that at all, just because <laughs> it's difficult with six. I I, I think I'd like mm. to be in a one piece band. <laughs> well, basically, <laughs> I can just argue you're, with myself. Then. You're a one piece band right now on Switch. That's right. I, I'm enjoying I'm enjoying that dynamic, and you know I can only yell at myself now. Yeah, well, it's obviously easier with the organization. So if you fail at something, you uh, just blame yourself. Correct. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I enjoy uh, learning and, and working and collaborating with people. Um, but I think that the more people that are involved, the more difficult it becomes to make decisions 
and or get things done. The, the, the saying, uh, too many cooks in the kitchen, man, that exists mm -hmm. for a reason. And I think it's pretty legit. Yeah, that is true. Basically, you know, everybody has their own opinions, and to find that consensus when everybody have the, the same vision, same opinion, it can it will go like might lead you through a lot of argues. Correct. That is for sure. So, how were like the tours that you were putting that you were putting on? How were they usually being made? Like you were just uh, like asking, I don't know, like trivia. Like for example, you brought trivia. Did was it your call or like a label call, or you just asked the label like we want to take this band, this band, and this band, and then you're going on tour? Um, so it it, it there's a it, it can be any of those ways you mentioned. Mm -hmm. it, it's all depending on the circumstance. What was the general um i idea that happened is we have a booking agent and mm -hmm. booking agents are in touch with other booking agents mm -hmm. who are also all in touch with record labels. So all record labels and agents are trying to do is they're trying to team up the best people that are going out at the same time frame. So um, like, for example, when Trivium's first tour uh, was came about, us and Machine Head were talking about doing a Roadrunner Road Rage tour. Mm -hmm. So Roadrunner presents Trivium to us. Like, hey, mm -hmm. here's a band we think would be a good fit. They're a new band. It would be great if you guys took them on this tour. And we're just like, yeah, that sounds cool. You know, like, let's fuck it. Let's do it. You know, we, uh, we had actually seen the band. Um, and I knew that right off the bat that they were, they were going to be something. Um, but then sometimes you get bands suggested to you that you've never heard of so you know one tour we were going out we like okay we, we want to headline so from the headlining dates that we want to do let's say it's uh november till this middle of december mm -hmm. then your agent comes back with all the bands that are available um that will tour with you so then it's a lot of times just kind of picking yeah, so um, maybe we should go with them. No, with them. No. Scrolling correct. the list. Uh, yeah. So a lot of times it's list picking. And then a lot of times it's just, uh, um, it just makes sense. Like, or you're, you're, excuse me, sometimes you're offered. So for example, you know, we were offered the Slayer tour. We didn't like, all of a sudden you just get an email one day and you're like, you've been offered this to tour with Slayer. And you're like, what? <laughs> so like how that happens, I don't know. Right. So maybe they found out about us and asked, but that's kind of been a thing too, where you're like, man, I would love to tour with crowbar. So you're like, you tell your agent like, Hey, is crowbar available? We're going out on tour. Oh no, they're not available. So it's like, damn it. We can't take out crowbar on this particular tour. Crowbar are not nice. even available. I actually, so it. yeah, it, that's just mm -hmm. kind of like how it works. It's, it's, it's a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember seeing Crowbar when we played the same festival in 2018. Like at that age that they are in now, holy fuzz, they're putting on such a show. They were actually one of the heaviest. Yeah, they're actually they replaced Parkway Drive on that night because Park Parkway couldn't come. So they were supposed to be the main headliners. But I think Crowbar did absolute madness. You know, it's really a fun thing when you can actually watch a band of this caliber from side stage. You're like, oh my god, about absolutely. That amount yeah, yeah, of yeah, energy. Sure. So another question. What was your favorite album to make from all the albums? Um, I had a lot of, time, of fun making Resurrection and The Infection. Both, both of those albums back-to-back -back was just a great cycle for us. We were all like really good friends. The band was doing really well, both um, in terms of uh, just our success financially and we were also doing very well in terms of our success as like a band that's gaining popularity and selling albums and selling shows so those two albums back to back they were just nothing but good times and a lot of laughs and a lot of fun uh where others were not as fun or there were they were rife with some sort of weird complication or some weird you know, oh shit, we gotta make the self title with a different drummer, or mm -hmm. the label's not as excited about it. But you know, there's always something. But those two albums, they were just clean and a lot of fun. But were there like albums, you know, like you probably you had like deadlines from labels, like un until what time you have to be finished with everything so like they can start doing the promo and stuff? 
Do you had anything like that well, with the labels? Well, that that that's com that's common. You want you essentially want what's called a three or four month marketing window. Mm -hmm. So if we were like, hey, we want our album to come out in May, then we knew it had to be done by January, because they need mm -hmm. it needs to be done and shipped off and sent. Because back in the day, let's say Metal Hammers to review it, their printing is is on a different cycle, yeah. so they have to have enough time to listen to it, write a review, and then get it into that magazine, which might not come out then for another month or so after that. So that's why back then, anyway, um, you you wanted around three months. Everything's different now, and now an artist can just drop it without a single press release, right? And like, oh, it's a surprise. We have a new album, but um, but back then, yeah, you you wanted a lot of time. Because it also had to go over to European countries, and that, that was especially with magazines were really, really big and essential for you know um, in the 2000s and 90s, and to get bands uh, out there. But now everything with the internet, it's 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 so much different. Yep, that is true. So when you were just starting out, were you like uh, booking everything ourselves, or you had a booking agent from the very beginning? Yeah, in the beginning, it's it's trying to get ourselves mm -hmm. onto local shows, selling tickets, you know, just kind of being involved in the local mm -hmm. scene, talking to the venue owners like, hey, we want to put on our own show, you know, and then find other local bands to play with. But we were luck we were lucky that we had a booking agent before we were signed, which is pretty oh. rare. But yeah. um, we had a booking agent um before we ever had a record deal so we were able to start getting good shows with like you know with national acts decent money mm -hmm. like oh here's 100 bucks to go open up for soulfly which doesn't sound like a lot of money at all but for an unknown unsigned mm -hmm. band yeah. that's about to play direct support to actually get money okay usually we'll it, nowadays you, know? you pay money to get these support slots and pay a good Correct. chunk of money Right, yes, absolutely. And like, did anybody ever like? Uh, was it a like a thing to try to negotiate? Like, for example, you know, like you set out a deal to a venue, or like a venue wants to book you, and they're like, "Oh my god, like we can't play pay X amount. We can only pay X amount." So, like, did anyone ever try to do that, or are you aware? Like, maybe your booking agent was telling you like such stories. Oh, it, it it's pretty much set in stone before you ever walk in. I mean, there's a rare anomaly where if like the show doesn't do well, where the promoter's trying to like, hey, can I pay you later? Because the show didn't make enough. That happens every now and then. But uh, um, but the amount is very set rare. In stone. Very rare. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. it's all negotiated beforehand, and there's contracts. So, um, our agent's mm -hmm. job because they're making ten percent of the income they're going to obviously want to negotiate the highest price they can yeah. possibly get us. Not every venue, not every city is able to pay the same amount. So you can't be like, Hey, we want $5,000 every night because you know, we might get that in Cleveland, but then like the next night we have to play in uh, Louisville, Kentucky and the venue only holds 200 people and the tickets are 15 bucks. You, yeah. you can't physically come up get with 5,000. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't exist. So you just basically got to take or you skip the town, right? Like that's kind of how it works. Like if you kind of have a threshold, like this is the lowest we can do a show for and then mm -hmm. you try to work your way up from there. So um you want here's your average. This is like a bare fucking bare bones we can do it yeah. just if it's if it's a place to get us from point a to point b you know, like along the way the, correct yeah. so exactly like let's say in cleveland you can make x amount five thousand or something louisville you can only make like two thousand but then like georgia you're going to make eight thousand so you do that two thousand dollar show because otherwise you're not going to make anything that day you're just going to have a day off and then yeah. you're spending about two thousand dollars <laughs> yeah because i know like a lot of bands that come to latvia because like bands touring like coming from germany for example here in germany they play to like two three four thousand of people here pretty much even when parkway which was they were basically coming up to the to their shine when they became becoming popular they had like they were on tour with chelsea green they had around five or six hundred people and that was the max the venue could hold so obviously, like mm -hmm. they they were unable to get like uh, more, and I think the tickets were around like thirty euros, something like that. 
exactly it just becomes a, like yeah i mean we we definitely didn't draw a lot of numbers in latvia but we also yeah. just it was we wanted to go there you know there's part of that it's like hey we should go there we've never been to this country we have fans there let's just go it works we're already kind of in the area um you know so some of those decisions are made like that it's like we want to go to new places and we want to go it's not always mm -hmm. about the money it's always you know, like, but can't, but you also don't want to lose money. So as long as you're not losing money and it makes yeah. sense and it's, you can and it's explore feasible and you can place. explore. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, that is good. So we are, are we, do we have any final questions? Let's see. So guys, if anybody in the chat has any final questions, feel free to type them in and we're going to slowly start wrapping it up. I see we've got something typing. But yeah, actually, do you ever miss touring or like you're absolutely fine with uh, where you are today? Like, and you don't ever want to experience. Oh, no, no, no. I, that, like, no, no, don't get me wrong. I, I, there, there's obviously I love playing live and, you know, I love being mm -hmm. a traveler and I, especially as a photographer now, there's so much more to, um, I'd like to go see and to, you know, photograph. Um, it just needs to be the right circumstances and the right reasons. And everyone just needs to be in a good mental health spot. Right. No, no yeah. one, we can't go into it with somebody like, Oh man, uh, I'm going through a divorce. So, uh, let's go on tour. Like, uh, no, <laughs> that'd be the fucking worst thing. <laughs> we need to go for like you know everyone's in a good mood like hey and we can't we can't be insane either we would have to do like two weeks right can't be like all right let's go out six months you know, we, it, we wouldn't it wouldn't work baby steps for us um and the reason i say that is just because i think that we cared so much about the band and and it ending the way it did it, it, it caused a lot of internal stress and it just not easy to you know it's like falling on uh, you fall off the bike i get it and you get hurt and it hurts and you eventually get on the bike again but like dude we broke like all our our legs and arms <laughs> that's kind of how it felt yeah. yeah it wasn't just uh it wasn't just a skinned knee and uh a, a bruised elbow from the bike fall this was like we got hit by a fucking semi <laughs> and we're picking up we're scattering we're still scraping pieces of ourselves off the concrete Okay, actually, a good that's question. kind of how it felt. Mm -hmm. Got another good question. Any live shows that you would should suggest to watch to learn more about the band? A live show of ours to watch? Yeah, yeah. So like uh, coming DVD, alive, maybe is the name of it. Yeah, D the DVD for coming alive is, um, and if you search it on Spotify, it's a live album. Hmm. Um, but it's called Coming Alive, and it was our tenth tenth Christmas show. So the band was probably around about 11 years, 12 years at that point. We had written the majority of our of our classic songs, if you will. So it's a good mix of all of our popular albums. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, another question. Any musicians you really want to meet and that haven't you haven't met yet? Is there anyone? I don't think so, honestly. Okay. I mean, I would love to meet Trent Reznor. But I'm a shy, introvert kind of dude, so I don't know what the hell I would say to him. Like, anytime I meet people I like and that I'm influenced by, I am just, I kind of like, hey, how's it going? Hi. Yeah, and then I freeze. So it's, it, that's, I don't know that it would go very well. Oh, perfect question. Why are you going to grow your dreads back? Uh, I, I, I've already started. Okay, do we actually get anything else? I think that's probably around all of the questions. Well, thank you so much. Sounds good. Yeah, thank you so much. Hope you, you had as much fun as I do. I did. Oh, it's always a pleasure getting to talk about these stuff. And uh, and it's cool that we met in such an interesting circumstance. And now yes. we can uh, get to do something like this. So I yes. appreciate it. And I appreciate your time. appreciate yeah. all of you guys for hanging out with us and asking good questions. So, and, yeah, guys, uh, if you're not following Mark, please do so. He is streaming on Twitch basically all the time. How many? Five times. A yeah, about five now. times a week, Monday through Friday. Yeah, two streams a day. So there is a link in the description, in the description, in the chat. Oh my God, I'm already thinking YouTube. <laughs> That's all right, brother. Okay. I, don't, I, always call, I always call this live TV. So 
Yeah, so it sort of is. So it is. Yeah, do, yeah. Actually, do you have anyone we should raid? Your call. Oh, yes. Um, anyone we should let's raid? Let's take a look. Dar. Yesterday, we almost went and visited some girl in a pool. Just she was just hanging out with her boobs out. I'm seeing if she's online. No, <laughs> I'm not sure um, we want that. <laughs> <laughs> uh even though we discussed howard in, johnson let's so. let's go to uh let's go to young gun oh, that's a yes. fun rocks rocksmith streamer yes, colt is a great guy so what should our raid message be don't call this guy a cocksucker that's for sure hey, play play brain stew cocksucker um oh, wait let's see oh i don't know Okay, now let me finally get this. Yes, there we go. Now we're actually rating the right young gun. So what should be the what should be the raid message? Uh play some skinnerd. <laughs> I don't know. Is uh, that good? Does that work? Anything you think about. Play some skinnerd. Like that. Oh, there there we you go. go. Perfect. Hashtag Howard Johnson. Kill switch. Hashtag Howard Johnson. <laughs> Free bird. All right, everybody. Uh, okay, yeah. See you in there. Some... Okay, guys, let's go. Thank you so much for hanging out. Hope you had as much fun as we did. We will catch you next time. Follow Mark, join the raid, and yeah. Take care, everyone. Have an amazing weekend.